Gaming's perpetual window into the future, the Deus Ex franchise has long been regarded as one of the most innovative series ever created. We're looking back at the iconic franchise and getting an inside look at what's coming next. I'm Naomi Kyle, and this is DX15. In a dystopian future of 2052, Deus Ex has long been regarded as one of the best PC games of all time, with over 1 million copies sold since its debut. Today we begin our journey with the original founders of Deus Ex. Fifteen years later, we're sitting down with Chris Norton, Sheldon Picotti, and Warren Spector as they reflect on the genesis of the idea, their influences for the futuristic story, and how the game's success spawned a franchise. Hey, you look like the vigilante type. If you told me anybody was going to care about any game for 15 years, I would have said you were nuts. The thing that kills me is it's not just that people think about it and talk about it. Uh, I get emails from people all the time telling me they're still playing it. I talked to some people who said, oh, I play it every year and just make a point to go back and experience it again just because it was so interesting and different at the time. That's, I think that's amazing. Like, I'm blown away by that. Yeah, I'm surprised. I have students that say it's the, one of their favorite games of all time. I didn't expect it to be the success that it eventually turned out to be, but that didn't matter. Like, we were making the game we wanted to make. We were all super dedicated to doing it the right way and making it tell the story we wanted to tell and present the choice and the stuff that we really focused on to the players. The artists, the art team, they all seemed to really enjoy the work they were doing. The style was solid, everything was good. The design team meshed well with the art team. We all worked together really well. I gotta admit, I, I did think it was going to be kind of a cult classic as opposed to a mega hit, but it was the game I was gonna make somehow, some way, sometime, and nobody was damn well gonna stop me. I didn't care if it sold three copies. Well, I started thinking about Deus Ex in 1994, actually, which was six years before the game shipped. I was tired of making games or playing games about guys in plate armor with giant swords and you being the last space marine between the Earth and alien invasion. I was about to start uh, another company entirely and I got a call from John Romero up in Dallas from Ionstorm saying, how would you like to make the game of your dreams with no creative interference? No one will ever tell you anything. And I just, you know, who says no to that opportunity? <laughs> Deus Ex Machina is a literary criticism term that basically says a writer writes him or herself into a corner, you know, that you can't get out of. And so a god descends from the heavens and just says, poof, well, that plot problem is solved. Deus Ex is kind of a statement about how bad game stories are. You know, it was three or four years before the millennium and everybody expected Y2K to destroy the world. And I, I started thinking about what are people thinking about? What do people care about right now? And everywhere I turned, I saw another nutty conspiracy theory. Give me a chopper and a pilot and I'll handle it. The starting point for Deus Ex was uh, what if every conspiracy theory people believe to be true is true? What happens if you take a guy who believes that things are black and white, good and evil, and throw them into a world that's all shades of gray. What's gonna happen when we have mechanical augmentation and nano augmentation? Uh, what does it mean to be human? And then on top of that, what happens when you throw in uh, AI that actually becomes sentient? And all that stuff, it's actually all come true. <laughs> a lot of people ask me, how did you predict all this stuff? It's like, we didn't predict anything. We tried a whole bunch of different stuff and we told a lot of different stories and some of them just happened. Because in the future, you don't necessarily know how that particular object is gonna react. You know what it is today, but maybe in 50 years, you know, computers don't look like computers anymore. So we can kind of reimagine what objects might be and then make them behave the way we want them to behave based on our technical limitations, which was a very nice little uh, cheat. I think whenever you write fiction, you have to believe in it yourself as an author. And so no matter what the element was, whether it was aliens coming to Earth, or you know the Templars or something, we did enough research to 
find out what was true about them and put them into the storyline in a way that was believable. So I think that's why some of the technology predictions in particular seem kind of cogent because it was using terminology of the time that actually was real technology and still holds up together pretty well today. Lead the way. The big strength of the game is that we didn't try to contain the player on a track. We just let the player go and attack objectives in whatever order they wanted and gave the player freedom to explore the story in their own way. It's not about beating a boss. It's not about just, you know, saving a princess. It's about how do you think the world should be? Not how does the designer want the world to be, not how does the character want the world to be. How do you as a human being playing the game think the world should be? Some people think it's a right-wing game, some people think it's a left-wing game. And it's because, you know, some people read more of the stuff that was supporting the left-wing in-game than the right-wing in-game. It's all in there. It's a game you can play over and over and over again and get more story and get a, a different experience. <laughs> I think there are a lot of games out there that were influenced by it. We were kind of the first game that mashed up genres in the way that we did. At least one of the first games that really put players in control of the story. And since then, you know, you can rattle off the names of plenty of games that are, are now doing that, frankly doing it probably better than we did. But it's nice to feel like you made a difference, not just to players, but actually to, to other developers as well. It's been a fascinating look at how Deus Ex began, but the journey isn't over yet. In the next chapter of our series, we dive into the making of the sequel, Invisible War. I think something's going on here. After all the critical acclaim and success of the original, Warren Spector and his team were eager to build on their momentum. And in 2003, Deus Ex Invisible War was released. Set in 2072, it took place 20 years after the events of the first game. Today we learn more about the more mature tone and the creator's feelings on the future of Deus Ex. Sounds like a plan to me. With Invisible War, the primary motivation was to make the game more accessible. We wanted to reach even more people. And the first game, it was pretty hardcore. We were making a game for ourselves and we were all pretty hardcore gamers. But I always felt that making a game where if the shooting is too hard for you, don't shoot, try something else. If the sneaking is too hard for you, don't sneak, try something else. And I always thought that was a really mainstream idea. Just making the world safer, one mad scientist at a time. In Invisible War, we really wanted the player to be more important than the story. Yeah, one thing we tried to do is bring the player even closer into the story by letting the player define who the main character is. The player's hometown is destroyed at the beginning of the game, and part of the motivation of that was to let the player really put themselves into the story and try to make it their own. By 2072, anything could happen, and almost everything does in Invisible War, I think. We started with the notion that all of the end games happened from the first game, so a cataclysm had already happened. And that put us into a world that was hugely shaken up and completely different than anything we know today. And I think that in itself put the player in a very strange place. The haves and have nots element is an important part of our world today. It was an undercurrent in the first game, but it became a very important part of the second one. Right around the time we were building Invisible War, there were protests against the WTO, and those are pretty literally translated into 70 years in the future, with uh, Seattle being stratified, with the World Trade Organization having little enclaves of cities that they control. And religious strife, too. I mean, you could see the rise of the religious right when we were working on that game, and so a lot of that entered into the storyline. Yeah, I've been completely impressed by the way the IDOS team has approached the franchise with what seems to me like complete reverence. They've taken apart the DNA of the original game and thought really hard about the content of the story, how to make it political and cerebral at the same time as being a, a dramatic story. The Deus Ex games, Human Revolution, was about something and I was really, really happy about that. And I really felt empowered as a player. I hope uh, it's still going in 15 more years. And I really hope that whoever is making Deus Ex games in the future, that they really build on the idea of empowering players. Give the player real choice instead of just, oh, well, we're just gonna drag you along and kind of pretend that you have control, but you really don't. 
Sharing authorship with players is the thing that games can do that no other medium can do. And so we have to do that better and better and better. Well, that wraps up our time with the original creators. Be ready for the next chapter, where we sit down with the developers at Eidos Montreal, who brought Deus Ex back to life after eight long years with Human Revolution. In 2011, a whole new audience was introduced to the world of Deus Ex with Human Revolution. Taking place in 2027, 25 years before Deus Ex and 45 years before Invisible War, Human Revolution was a relaunch of the franchise by Eidos Montreal. So listen as we sit down with its creators and we learn how they resurrected such an iconic franchise, why Deus Ex is so captivating, and just how close the real world is to one of Adam Jensen's 2027. Some people will be left behind. It's evolution. We've got to help you. The idea was to create a studio that would bring Eidos franchises alive again. If we didn't believe we could bring something to yeah. the table and we didn't think we could uh, revive the franchise, we would have never accepted. In Eidos Montreal, we have uh, strong values, we have a philosophy, we have a mission, we have a vision, and so it's very important to us. We were coming from different studios in the past and we all left the, our previous project, our previous studio, just because we wanted to work on their sex uh, human revolution. It was very, very challenging. It's creating a new studio, and we decided to use a big, 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 big license. The fact that we worked together before helped a lot. There's a nightclub in this sector called The Hive. If our hacker went to ground here, chances are the owner will know. It's a franchise that is all about choices and consequences. It was one of the first games out there that made you feel that you were part of that world. I was more interested in the human story behind it than the technology itself. Transhumanism was part of the yeah. franchise, but it right. wasn't like a... At the forefront. Yeah, it wasn't overly stated. We need to bring cyberpunk, but we need to make it ours at the yeah. same time. It can't just look like the run of the mill. Even before starting the conception, the design of the new Deus Ex game, we just played it again, a lot, a lot, to analyze it, to define what was the pillars of this game. And from that point, we brought our signature to it. It's definitely a tough challenge when you listen to something in 2000 and you're like, how am I going to make this relevant by today's standards? We kind of came to this sort of mix where we used organic instruments to sort of represent the more human side and we went with more of the synth electro to represent more of the aug side. Sometimes we have some fights between each other but you know every fight we had it's for the best for the title. We have something very niche, very specific and, and the gamers are looking for that now. They want story, they want strong themes, they want strong message. They want to be immersed in a very strong universe, and their sex is perfect for that. It's all about choices and consequences and self-expression, so it's a game that you kind of play to determine how you want to play it and how you want to approach problems and how you want to see the outcomes of your decisions. And since it's very, very story-driven, it also has a really good opportunity to explore some very interesting themes in the world and to put up kind of a mirror to the world and, and allow you to experience these really deep issues, very interesting ethical and moral issues. And stop them. Megan was on the brink of something historic. I love you. Deus Ex Human Revolution is really exploring the themes of transhumanism. You're looking at building a world in which technology and biology are combining. So what does that mean and what does it mean to be human? We ask gamers to come to visit us and play the game. Even if it's rough, it's not completed we ask their feedback. Uh, it's very important to us to ensure that we uh, fulfill their expectations because the, the bar is very high. If you want to play the game like very rapidly, you have the means. Uh, if you want to take your time to explore, you're able to do that. The emotion is very important for us. It's not just play a game, it's, 
is create an experience. Well, when we predicted seven years ago that human beings are going to get prosthesis, this is happening right now. And you know, for us, it was more than just uh, a product. It was a belief that this is the world we're going to be living in the future. We even had people that had disabilities writing to yeah. us and like, oh my god, your game gave me hope or your, your stuff like that, you yeah. know, which was really, really touching. There was someone also that wrote that after playing the game, he said, I feel I need to be a doctor and help people in life. And when you read that, you're like, it reminds you why you're doing what you're doing. Because we were delivering a great game, we can come out with uh, something successful. It can be talented, but if there is no match, you know, no fit, uh, it won't work. By the end of the game, like players would go, wow, it was entertaining, it was quite a journey, and it made me think. Don't worry, there's a lot more to say about Deus Ex. Next time, we get an inside look at the next game, Mankind Divided. We'll see how Adam's journey fits into the overall Deus Ex universe. Deus Ex Mankind Divided continues where human revolution left off. Taking place two years later, Adam Jensen returns and fights with new body augmentations and technology in a world forever changed by the Aug incident. I got a no kill order. Would have thought he'd done enough to warrant extreme prejudice. Mankind Divided is a much different place than Human Revolution. Today we learn more about the new game, its place in the overall franchise, and what dark corners of the Deus Ex universe remain unexplored. Rucker. A lot of things happened uh, between uh, Human Revolution and Mankind Divided. We plan for a transmedia approach for the Deus Ex universe. So it's not just a game now, it's a franchise. How do we get to do more, make more experience, but also that it's exponentially bigger? You know, when you do a painting, you start with your foundation, and you know, like you just block things in, and then you're like, okay, this is works, and then we go with the details, and you know, the crazy rendering, and it looks like HR was sort of blocking, and now it's like, wow, it's really coming to life. You walk in a room, and the room can tell you a story. Uh, so with the Dawn Engine and the new gen consoles and the, the powerful PCs nowadays, we can really create rich environments. The Dawn Engine just opens up new possibilities in terms of expanding the tool set. We've really achieved this vision like we had it at the yeah. beginning and, uh, you know, we maybe we had achieved just 50% of it, I think, now. It's very much there and uh, stuff as well, like very cool next-gen stuff like the hair that we do and, and, and you know, all these new these new additions and um, the lighting system has been yeah. totally revamped. The, the game just feels, I mean, people are, are noticing it right away. Mankind Divided takes place two years after Human Revolution. So now you're facing a world state where the mechanically augmented are being reviled. Many of them are being forced to live in segregated camps. You're facing a lot of cops, a lot of augmented people. How do you deal with them? Do you, where's your judgment? You can go in guns blazing, you can go you combat but non-lethal, or you can avoid it all. We all want to make a game that we want to play. You know, it's a mature title. It's something that is dealing with kind of serious contemporary now issues. When we talk about the setting for Mankind Divided, we're talking about the mechanical apartheid. We've entered a period in this universe where the mechanically augmented are really being discriminated against. There's a lot of paranoia about them and a lot of feeling that these people are second-class citizens. These are people who don't deserve to be with the rest of society because of something that they had no control over. It's a much darker world, a much more cynical world, a world more bathed in fear and suspicion. We try to push the augmentations this time around to have more variety all over the place, but we... More visual. More well. visuals, yeah. yeah, more more visceral, more impactful. Yeah, I like to engage in, in combat and, and get uh, get my hands dirty when I play a Dark Sex game, and I think that we're really boosting that, that offer a lot. Well, the combat was very uh, important. We put a lot of effort in the combat intensity. We designed a level design to open more the level. Part of the game takes place in Prague, 
And one of the things we already did was bring in real Czech actors. It's the customary final request of the condemned man. Please, do not kill any more of my people on your way out. We did no compromise. Once again, we wanted to push the envelope. The goal is really to give to the player more than just the game. We wanted to make sure that you can be a stealthy agent and be a killing machine or be a combat-oriented kind of guy and still be like, I care about uh, human lives, so I'm going to spare them. So we put a lot of efforts in that sense to make sure that the augmentation experience is way more rounder, uh, way more possibilities, no matter what your play style is. In the Deus Ex franchise, is really about uh, empowering the player with uh, choosing the way he wants to play. It's not just go stop the bad guy, it's like, is the bad guy a bad guy? Why is he doing that? My favorite part of this franchise is really the narrative aspect, really the story. I really like the fact that it's much more than just save the princess. You can spend 10 minutes on a side quest and finish it, or depending on what you do in that side quest, you can discover all these other intricate branches that are leading off, and you can end up having an hour adventure just with a side quest. It's the type of game where you can play it one time and play it one way and have one experience and then replay it again and make different choices in the game and you will have a different experience and you'll have different conversations depending on how you play it. It feels and sounds more mature. We have a much more robust music system that allows us to do a lot more. Whereas before Human Revolution and as I spoke, we had like roughly three layers to play with. We now, we're only limited by how we want to do it. We set our own limitations. Shit, Jensen, behind you. Our job as game developers and as people who are working with science fiction to hold up a lens to the world and say this is what we're showing you and it's what exists out there now. So how does that make you feel and what do you want to do about it? We will not sit idly by and allow our rights to be eroded out of fear and ignorance any longer. I hope people will finish the game. I hope it, they are going to be, you know, curious enough to, to understand uh, what is behind all this. The most thing that I could be proud of is uh, when someone's going to pick up the game, play it and enjoy it. As simple as this. The old rules no longer apply. Well, this has been an amazing journey. From the insight on the game's creation to its rebirth on the modern gaming scene. It's been a pleasure to get so much inside information from the creators themselves. Deus Ex has proven to be one of the most unique universes in existence. The future for the franchise looks brighter than ever.